Well, I think the issue that you mentioned of Kyoto goes directly back to leadership. Um, I was at Kyoto on the 12th of, the, of December of exactly 1997 when Kyoto was enacted. And already by 1995, we had already passed the first carbon emission tax in Costa Rica. So you can do things if you want to do things in this space. You don't have to apply by the minimums. You can be forward thinking, you can move out there. Did it make me very popular as a president to pass a 15% carbon emission tax? No, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, that is also part of what being in a position of responsibility and leadership is all about. High quality agreement in Copenhagen for me means that the world begins to address the most fundamental economic breakdown which we have on the planet today, which is a lack of price on carbon. That is the greatest market failure the modern economy has. We need to put a price on carbon. We need a cap and trade system. And yes, we need to lower our emissions uh, as rapidly as possible. 30% by 2020 would already be a very good beginning. 80% by 2050. What we need to understand is that just as this is a marathon and not a 100 meter sprint, different countries, because of their starting points, may not begin on this line and finish over here in the 100 meter sprint. They may begin a little in back or a little in front. We should have that leeway. What we do need is to finish on the same line when we finish the marathon. And that requires an agreement which has a variable geometry. It recognizes the different starting points of countries and nations around the world, but it holds them responsible to rapidly catch up in the years that we have ahead of us so that as of year three, four, or five, or six, we are all singing to the same hymn and we're holding each other one accountable. Kuminaidu, this is the worst recession in living memory. Do you think we can expect much money to be set aside from the developed world for the developing world to deal with the polluter pays must pay principle that Kofi Annan was telling us about yesterday? Well, let's be very clear. When rich nations have made commitments, even when there wasn't a financial crisis, as Kofi Annan will very well tell you, they didn't deliver, whether it was on the aid commitment of 0.7% in 1970, more than 35 years, and only about four countries meet that target. So right now, I think we have to understand that the economics tells us, Nicholas Stern, who's done this major study, says that bottom line is the cost to the global economy of inaction on climate change, whereas now we're having a sort of 5% hit could be in about 10, 20 years, about 20% impact in terms of just the cost of, if you can just imagine Katrina, for example, Hurricane Katrina and the, the, the costs that were associated to, to respond because we had not invested in levies and other sort of, uh, you know, simple things that could have been done at a much lower cost. So bottom line is, even if you take the economic argument that on the long, medium to long term, that in fact the costs associated with inaction is significantly more. And let's be very clear about what's missing here. It's not money. What is missing is political will. Let's be very clear. Because, you know, on, on debt cancellation, for example... But it's the money that counts, isn't it? I mean, if you've lost your house or you can no longer grow your crops where once you could, it's not political will that's going to help you feed your family, is it? Well, well I'll tell you how it works, the connection between political will and money. We've been asking for years for third world debt to be written off. To write off all of third world debt is about $500 billion. For years now, those of us in the developing world, whenever we asked for it, we were led to believe that $500 billion was a fantastically huge amount of money. In the last 18 months, we've discovered, because there was political will to rescue the banking industry, that $500 billion is simply small change in real finance when there is political will to mobilize the resources to act on an issue. We need the same kind of money that has been used to bail out those that have got us partly into the mess that we find ourselves in to actually address in with real Encourage the issue of climate change alongside the issue of poverty. And I want to just endorse what Jose Maria said earlier, that we want to say the struggle to combat climate change and the struggle to end global poverty must be seen as two sides of the same coin and should not be seen in contradiction with each other.
So how do you get that leadership? How do you get that political will? I want to hear from you out here in the audience. Please start testing Jose Maria Figueres Olson. Start testing Kumi Naidu with their ideas. Do you agree with them? Is it a cathedral we should be looking for to be built? I've got the mic. I'm a very important person while I have the mic. As soon as you get the mic, you become the most important person in the room. So can we see some hands going up? Ah, I have a hand at the back. Sarah Walpole from the UK. Um, let's remember that the reason that we're, going, that we're calling for cuts it, and addressing climate change in Copenhagen is because of human, human experience and well-being. So we need the health voice to be heard in Copenhagen. So I just want to um, put a message out, perhaps not just to those two on the stage, but to everyone here, something that you can all do in 30 seconds or in longer if you have the time. We need the health voice to be heard, and as far as I'm aware, at the moment, there's not enough mo mobilization on that front. In the UK, we have an organization called the Climate and Health Council, www.climateandhealth.org, and we're trying to bring together the health voice. We want people to sign our pledge, which is on our website. Not all of you come from the health background, but if you do, go to our website and sign it. If you don't, find a friend and get them to go to our website and sign it. And we want partners in other countries as well. So get in touch with us um, and let's get that health voice heard because we need leadership, not just calling for economic changes, but also for health, for changes to improve people's health. Thank you very much. Well, we see from the young how it is you get your message across, eh? I've got another question here. Question. Okay. Um, if I can just start with a response, though, Nisha, and that really is that you asked, okay, let's give some feedback to what we've heard so far. Um, my feedback is that, oh, sorry, my name is Mala Nimher. I'm a climate campaigner from India. Um, I've been working on climate issues for about 20 years now as at Kyoto, along with yourself, and I really think that we need to change the rhetoric, change the game, and fundamentally change our approaches. This is not about us and them, Kumi. We're all in this together. And what I want to see in my lifetime is the world at the United Nations reflected as the world that it is. I don't want a G77 and China, which has South Korea in it, which has countries which have a trillion dollar foreign reserves asking for the same kind of benefits as a Tanzania or a Haiti. I want the world to be recognized for what it is, and I want us to take responsibility instead of bleating that other people should do it, and it's about the rich versus the poor. In my country, and let's get practical about what needs to be done. In my country, for the first time over two years ago, we started leading a national mobilization campaign to hold our politicians and negotiators to account for what they were doing in all of the COPs before. This is COP 15. There have been 14 years before this. And we started a campaign to follow these people so that we turn the spotlight of public scrutiny on what they were saying in our name. Let's all of us do this, 192 countries, let's make this enfranchised. Let's democratize the discussion. Each of us needs to know what, being, what is being negotiated in our names. And then you will begin to see responsiveness. We talked earlier about the need to have low carbon national strategies. Let's do that. We can't wait for six months. We need that to be done now. We need that to be gender analysis. We need that, okay, let me, let me, Okay, the question is, how do you think between now and not December, as we're talking, we're having the MEF meeting in Washington, D.C., 17 countries which account for 75% of the world's emissions now. How do you think in the next two months we can change the rhetoric and change the political play on this? Thank you. Um, so we had a lot of exhortation there. Are you guys ready to give us an answer? How can we change the rhetoric, Jose Maria? Jose Maria? 